Welcome in to DNVR Buffs After Dark. I'm Henry Chisholm, and uh, we've got Ryan Konigsberg here tonight. Oh, hey. We thought that there was, like, a chance that this was going to be a really, really, really fun post-game show. Um, but uh, the Buffs lost, and the score was 73-61. to 61. They played a really good UCLA team. Um, wasn't a lot of fun watching that game. Just kind of a lot of stress, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, this is what it's like um, watching, like, college basketball on the road. I've said this once. I've said it a million times. You should never expect to win on the road. Yeah. I mean, literally, regardless of the opponent, you should never expect to win on the road. And they were going up against the number five team in the country tonight. So I didn't expect them to win by any stretch of the mind. Um, but, Henry, I have to say I came away feeling better about this team than I did coming into the night. I think that's fair. I think that that's fair. Um, it's worth pointing out. I think two out of every three games in college basketball, the home team wins. And you talk to Tab Boyle, the path to a successful season, to a bye, to whatever you're trying to achieve, to, to win the Pac-12, split the road games, win your home games. And that. UCLA was <laughs> never going to be a part of that split on the road. Probably not. Probably not. I mean, you know, again... You always cross your fingers going into the game and hope mm -hmm. and say, man, maybe someone gets hot from three and yep. UCLA, you know, has a key guy get banged up, which they did. Um, and once in a blue moon, all the stars align and you beat a really good team on the road. But again, you know, as soon as fans start talking about like, oh, this team never wins on the road, you just lose me. No one ever wins on the road. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's it doesn't impossible. happen. No one does it. Um, like, they'll go up against um, ASU on the road this year. ASU, mm -hmm. by the way, today scored 29 points in a 40-minute regulation college basketball game. They scored 29 points. Do I want to see them on the road? No, I don't. It's going to be a grind at best. So they went into UCLA today against a team who started this season number two in the country mm -hmm. and they absolutely battled now when you look at that ucla team it's one through five every single guy can get you on every single possession it's extremely difficult and to be honest they also had an unfriendly whistle tonight so when you're going up against a more talented team on the road and you're not getting the whistle in your favor you're just never going to win. But these guys never tucked their tail between their legs. Mm -hmm. And they just kept punching back at one point. I think there's 10 minutes left in the game. I said, Hank, they got to get a kill here. Three straight stops. They ended up getting seven. <laughs> it's Include, crazy. Well, actually, six out of seven throw. with a one out of two free throw in there. So they gave up one point in seven possessions. And unfortunately, they just don't have the offensive firepower right now. Um, to be able to go and capitalize that against a team like UCLA, who, you know, we, I just talked about how they can score one through five. Well, they can also defend one through five. They're extremely long. They're extremely athletic. They're extremely difficult to beat uh, off the dribble, you know, off the pass, whatever it is. So despite the fact that they, gr they were grinding and grinding and grinding, this team doesn't necessarily have a go-to option right now. And if you were to identify their go-to option on offense, it would probably be Evan Batty, who unfortunately can't stay on the floor right now. Yeah, and I was going to take that different direction. Jabari Walker tonight. I think you said it a couple minutes into the game. Jabari Walker belongs here. Yes, he does. And that's when things were really ugly. They didn't really have anything synced up. And they got the ball to Jabari, and Jabari didn't necessarily always score. You have three turnovers in the game, which you don't love. But he belonged. He put up enough points for the number of possessions. I mean, he was 7-11 from the field, and we'll talk more about him later, but... More shots. I, I almost, exactly. Just get him the ball more. He yeah. force, forced the defense to respect him. Force them to overplay him. It's the same thing I was talking about after Paradise Jam when I was talking with Justin Michael about that Rams team. How many, I think two of those games of their three in the first half, the offense for Colorado State, just disgusting. Except that whenever they got to David Roddy, something good happened. Yeah. And then the second half, they just fed him the ball and fed him the ball and fed him the ball, and it worked. And, you know, Jabari, he's still growing. He's still becoming that kind of guy. But that's the way the sport of basketball works. 
it's built around stars. And if you have somebody who is finding success, you can't afford to be passing it around to other players, doing these other things. You just got to give them the ball until they overcommit and then figure things out from there. This is crazy. You can tell me what his stat line was in a second here. Mm -hmm. You know who I felt like also belonged on the floor tonight? Who? Lawson Lovery. I like it. What was his stats? Um, it's going to be nothing. <laughs> It's not quite nothing. He actually did score one point and had one rebound. Two fouls, one turnover. 0 for 0 from the field. 14 minutes, he was a minus three. There you go, actually. That's that's <laughs> the one. You know, uh, Mace always talks about it. I believe it was Pat Bullen huh. who once went into uh, the office of whoever was running PR at the time and said, I don't know what it is about this team, but there's something I don't feel great about it, and I'm sure there's a stat that will explain it. That stat, actually, the fact that he was only a minus three in 14 minutes in a game that they lost by 12, yeah. tells me why I felt like he belonged on the floor tonight. Yep. In fact, if I'm Tad Boyle and this coaching staff, I'm showing loss in the tape of this game and saying, I never, ever, ever want to see less than this from you ever again, because I saw him moving his feet faster than I've ever seen him move his feet. I saw him making uh, moves more confidently than he's ever made, and that was really, really encouraging to me. To me, he looked like he belonged on the floor. He didn't get punked um, defending their stud freshman. Who was beating up Evan Batty. Who was beating – yes, exactly. So that was uh, a little thing I wrote down in the notebook of Lawson all of a sudden looks like a college basketball player tonight. It was a lot of fun. Yep. And, I mean, we just been waiting for it to click. You forget, though, just what that feels like. Um, Elijah Parquet, for example. There was a time when he was on the court – when we would kind of grin and bear it. You're just like, oh no, this again, this again. It's not going to work. It just doesn't really fit. And that was actually, Dalen Coots was in that rotation too. And yeah, in that yeah, position yeah. with Shane Gatling in there, he's like, ah. And then for Eli, everything clicked. And he played really yes. good defense. And he started making those threes. And you just have to hope that that's this time for Lawson. Because tonight, still, when he was one-on-one -on -one in the post, you're sitting there thinking, oh no, here it comes. He's going to foul him. He's just going to get burned. All of a sudden, he's going to be on the wrong yeah. side of this guy. It didn't really no. happen. He, he held his own in there, and that is a huge step forward for Lawson. It's really exciting. I'm telling you, if you could show me a side-by-side -side of this, his foot speed against Montana State versus his foot, foot speed tonight, it would look like two entirely different players. I'm um, really proud of him. I feel like he rose to the occasion a little bit, knowing that this was a really big game. Mm -hmm. Jabari, absolutely number one, you know, rise yep. to the occasion guy. Other guy who I felt like at a lot of times belonged on the court was KJ Simpson. I thought that was where you were going to go the first time. Yep. Um, he he absolutely belonged out there. <laughs> he has the athleticism. He has the strength. He has the quickness to play with a team like that. Now, again, there's little nuances missing from all of these guys yes. that keep him from winning this game or even getting close to winning it. But – you can just see little things of that guy belongs out there against anyone. And KJ was another guy who I, I felt like really, really showed tonight that like he's just give him a year and he's going to be one of the top players in this league. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's still the finishing for him. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, it's not just the finishing. You know, I talked to Tad a couple days ago and he said uh, the not – he didn't say the defense is bad. He said defensive confidence. He still just needs to work on the defensive confidence, hmm. which I thought was interesting. But the, but the finishing, there's just a few more where you look at him and you say, why, why did that ball hit the backboard so hard? <laughs> like, you just don't see that. You know, and I'm somebody who watches the Nuggets a lot. I watch a lot of NBA basketball. And I've kind of grown into the college game. You just don't see the bang, and then it's coming straight back. There's still some of that. There's a couple little floaters that will just go up and over, and you're like, yeah, that wasn't all that close. Still, though, I had the same complaint in the last game when he shot 60% from the field and put up 12 of the bench's 17 points, something like that. KJ's good. Yes. KJ's good, and he's going to keep getting more minutes, and that was a lot of fun. Um, this is this is more of a bigger picture takeaway. Um, I, I got my ASU reference in there, and Shane is uh, <laughs> here feeling much worse than any Buffs fan. I promise you that tonight. He is. Yeah, for ASU the, lose 55-29 tonight. And for those who don't know, Shane covers uh, Arizona State for PHNX. That's a, some yes. important context here. And is a producer, but this feels... 
more relevant. This is not a, in relation to his producing. <laughs> he did not put up 29 production points tonight. How I many hope. games this year did Colorado football score 29? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't score it in the first game. Uh, didn't? Uh, didn't, I thought 35? it was 20, Oh, okay. Oh, you're, they won by 28. It was 35 That's 7. Right. Yep. Um, they scored 29 against Oregon. They did score exactly 29. Uh, they scored 20, 30 yeah. against Arizona, right? Yep. Okay. All right. You'll get there, guys. Yeah. You'll get there. Definitely. Um, but yeah, bigger picture, the three point shooting. It's got to be better. No, it's got to be better. And it's, again, it's something that comes and goes, and you're on the road and all those sorts of things. But when you're five of 21, you know, this is absolutely a trend now. This is a five. good. That feels like a lot. It does. But it's a good shooting team when they're at the event center. When they went to Paradise Jam, things fell off. Tonight, things fell off. That's also a young team, too. Oh, These for sure. These are classic things you see with young teams. You know, they've shot a million shots in the course event center. They've shot zero shots uh, in Poly Pavilion before tonight. Now they've all shot two or three. Yeah. We'll Takes see. Takes a bit. It just, I mean, the free throws, too. 10 of 15. It's another one where, you know, it's not a five-point game. But if you have those five points, who knows how things could play out differently. Like, it's just so many of these little details that... Again, young team. It's just what happens. I mean, there's another way you could spin this game and say what? They were, uh, they would have been down. Oh, this is taking longer than I thought. Um, I have no idea where you're going, so I can't really help 14 you 14 to 7. They were down 15 to 9. And then didn't quite play them even the rest of the way. But you can look at those sorts of numbers and say, like, if it's not for that slow start, then they are right there. Then clawing back means you're actually building a little bit of a lead. They, they, they weren't uh, far off. Honestly, they just never went away. It's like one of those things where, you know, I'm sure if you're listening to the UCLA broadcast, every time UCLA gets a 10-point lead, the Buffs kind of scrap and get an and yep. one. And, and on the broadcast, they're saying, like, this Colorado team just won't go away. And credit to UCLA. They just had an answer for everything, every single run. At one point, the Buffs get it down to four with eight minutes left, I believe. Yeah. Uh, a little over eight minutes left. And... UCLA had an answer. I think they answered right back with a six over on, and it's just like, man, there's not much you can do about this, but really proud of this team. For sure. Um, and again, no one's going to like this. It's, it's kind of like how, you know, uh, in, in pros, when your team is like tanking or whatever, and you're like, no one's going to like this. It's gonna, It might not be that fun this year, mm -hmm. but it'll be fun next year once we get our number one overall pick. It's not quite that, but it's similar in the sense of there's going to be a lot of frustrating games this year. Um because it's a really young team who has yet to gel. But you look for little signs. You look for Lawson Lovering looking like he belongs on the court with the number five team in the nation. Mm -hmm. You look for KJ Simpson coming into his own. These are the little things that you're going to see this year that are going to really pay off next year and the years coming after yep. that. Um, and, and fight is something that can't be learned. I really don't think it can be taught. I don't think it can be learned fight comes from within you mm -hmm. and i really think this team is full of fight now of course that's that comes from their leader right they say teams take on the personality of their best player or their coach and, and evan batty might not even be their best player but the, the, this team takes on his personality yep and and he is a fighter he's a lion he is everything you could ever want as a coach but he's gonna leave that legacy behind with these guys even when he's not here in the future. So mm -hmm. this that's something that, again, four years from now, maybe not even that long, two, three years from now, when this team is, you know, grinding out tournament wins, we'll look back and say, remember when, you know, Evan Batty taught these guys how to fight? Yep, exactly. And, again, this game kind of took the shape that we had expected, right? Yeah. Like, I was in on the buffs to cover. I think that going into it, you know that for the most part this season, I think, what, in five of seven games to this point, maybe even six of seven, they've fallen behind early mm -hmm. and then fought their way back and made it close to the end. Five of six games, I mean, six of seven games came down to the final minute. Five of the six they won. And it's because they fell behind and had to work their way back against teams that weren't as good as them. Yeah. And when you play a team like UCLA, when you fall behind, you aren't able to make it back so far that you're able to win the game. You just can't afford to do that. And for the game to go that way, again, it's kind of what I expected. And 
hopefully they learned a lesson that you, you just got to come out a little bit sharper and you got to lock in on defense and make everything hard for them early. You got to find a way to finish your shots. And just so many little things where when UCLA had the ball at the beginning of the game, they looked so confident. And yes. their, their footwork was sharp. And their shots were so... They, it looked like they thought it was going to go in. Whereas when Colorado had the ball, even in the half-court offense, it was just like they're trying really hard. They're sprinting everywhere they go. And they were just a little bit out of control. And it just didn't... It's just not smooth. Yeah. It just wasn't smooth. And at one point, they kind of fell into that rhythm. It just didn't happen when they needed it to. Yeah. Uh, um, one of the... You know, this team's been in a little bit of an offensive slump as of late. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest difference between when they are scoring and when they haven't been is Keyshawn. For sure. Um, he's not doing the things he was doing against inferior opponents. Confidently uh, taking threes yes. from two steps behind the arc. And dribbling, getting to the rim, drawing fouls, shooting mid-range jumpers. Mm -hmm. He doesn't look like he wants to do anything. And Tiger Campbell's a good player, but he's a small guy. You know, mm -hmm. He shouldn't be able to lock you down from doing anything in the game. What did Keyshawn have? Keyshawn, one of five, two points. Need more. He was averaging like 20 points a game <laughs> in the first four games. <laughs> I know, and I talked to him a couple days ago and said, so I mean, 19 points first game, then 20, then 22. I was like, so after that third game, Tad said, this is when teams start to look at the tape and adjust mm. and, and play you like you are the number one scorer and, and figure out how to lock in and force you away from what you want to do. You know, obviously numbers aren't as good. Do, like, do you feel that difference? He said, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's totally different. They're closing out way outside the three-point line. It's just a little bit different game. Him. Exactly. And he said that he can feel that the space is open. He feels like his passing has improved because of it. But that's kind of that next step. Where in college basketball, you know, for Tristan Da Silva, Tristan Da Silva needs to go out there and score 20 points a few times so that defenses key in on him yeah. and shut him down. And then the next step is being able to beat those teams when they do try to shut him down like that. And that's where Keyshawn is at this point in his development. It's just time for him to figure out how to take that next step. And honestly, a big part of me thinks he just needs to shoot his way out of it. I mean, yes, you have to continue being aggressive. Yep. Um, and this team, this offense kind of relies on him being aggressive. For sure. So that, and then the other, you know, to move in it, while we're on the, the subject of disappointments, Evan Batty has gotten worse at staying on the floor. And I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what's going on there that's causing that. I don't know if teams are just saying go right at him to start the game because once you take him it's like taking the queen bee out of the hive mm -hmm. um and they're right um but he's gotta find a way to stay on the floor i don't care if he gets cooked yep for the first six minutes of the game as long as he doesn't get a foul yep and in his defense you know he he did really get some tough calls tonight and that's always going to be true for how him. is he getting targeted like a preseason all pack 12 guy it's because he's big it's as simple as that. He's the big guy, and when he makes contact with somebody, it's going to be a quick whistle. And it's been that way his entire career, and it sucks. But truth is, that's the world that he lives in. And if you can't find a way to adjust, it's just not going to work out. And again, like... This is coaching. Tonight though. was particularly bad. It was. And, and the refs were bad all night for, for everyone, True. honestly. They, I thought they were... Their bad calls slanted more towards the buffs. Um, of course, I'm yes. going to feel that way. I'm, I'm sure there's a UCLA out, fan out there who feels the opposite. But I really did feel like it was slanted against the buffs. And on the flip side, I felt like it really was slanted against Evan Batty. Yep. But it's up to Tad and this coaching staff to figure out what they need to tell Evan to keep him on the floor. He cannot do this. We, we can't mm -hmm. have Evan Batty with two fouls before the under eight in the first half of every single game, which is what it feels like is happening right now. Yep. So something's got to change there. I wish he would get some respect from the refs of just like, look, he's big. We get it. He's burly. Call him when he fouls it, when he, when he commits a foul, but don't call him for fouls just because he's bigger than the other guys. It sucks. It really sucks. 36 fouls in that game. 36 fouls in 40 minutes. <sighs> It was so bad. I mean, the amount of 
charges and illegal screens they called alone was enough for a full game of all fouls combined. Did that feel like a physical game to you? No. No, it wasn't. That was the softest game I've seen. Yeah. And, and there were still that many fouls. There was almost no contact in that game. No. No, I mean, you had um, John, ha uh, Haquez, Haquez yeah. hits the floor hard at one point. Early. Jabari hits the floor hard one point late in the game. Those are like the two moments where anyone hit the floor hard. Yeah. It was not a physical game, and there were that many fouls. It was a really bad job of the referees. Um, it, it was not the difference in the game. Let's make that clear. True. Um, but it absolutely was the difference in the enjoyability of the game. I don't think sure anyone who was. watched that thought, like, what a great ball game. No. And here's the other thing I'll say. I saw the timeline kind of like lighting up Tony Padilla, who is the ref. Oh, he's the worst. See, and that's what everybody <laughs> was saying. I had never heard his name before. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know that this was a thing. I, as soon as you said it, I saw his face. Ex yeah, exactly. And now I know. <laughs> now, like, I didn't know who he was for the rest of my life. When I hear the phrase Tony Padilla, I know exactly what that means. Yeah, and that's just him, we not call him what TV you want. Tony. Wants a little shine. Wants a little run on the TV. <sighs> that's terrible. That's terrible. If you're looking for some shine, though, Saturday Neon. He's also, I think he's based in Colorado, which makes it even worse. We should find him. No, <laughs> no. We should not find him. We're not going to find him. We should him. send him a letter. Strongly worded. Can we cut the letters out of, like, the magazine? Saturday Neon. We Whoa. love Saturday Neon. Um, Why are we getting derailed over here? I think we we're about to dox somebody. Um, but <laughs> I'm not totally sure. I've never been in on a dox before, but that, I think that's what it feels it, like. It did feel. Uh, I like. It was a little doxy. Um, yeah, Saturday Neon. They make awesome stuff. Particularly, they make these neon signs. That's why they call it Saturday Neon. Bet you can't guess. They're college sports logos. That's the Saturday. The neon is the neon. Uh, it's a great name, and of course, it's a great name. It's a company made by two. Former Colorado Buffaloes. It's Hell, based yeah. in Denver. And now's the time to order from them because you can get your Christmas gifts delivered. Can Use the code to Tony Padilla. <sighs> Don't give him a buffs one. <laughs> he wouldn't like that. No. With what if you could get a neon of anything to send to Tony Padilla, what would it be? Uh, I mean, himself. I that's what know. he would love the most. It's a big that's, middle finger. He would that's love That's who that. he's most interested in. <laughs> it's true. Um like I said, start by two Buffaloes. They're based in Denver. They'll give you free shipping. Use the code DMVR for 10% off. And they're really nice neon signs. We actually don't have one out here right now, uh, but they have the Buffs. They have the Rams. They have a whole bunch of other schools. They're adjustable, so you can change the brightness. It's nice. I think, I think you can even make them flash, you too, can if make you them want. Flash you can make really them flash if you really want to like, annoy your neighbors or something. Oh, you could turn it like full brightness flash yes pointed at him it's like the it's like christmas vacation if you're maybe if your neighbors with tony padilla yes that's what we need to do right get a get big neon neighbors. sign for tony padilla's neighbor uh if any of you actually want to commit to that order these at saturdayneon.com use the code dnvr for 10 percent off again you're supporting buffs you're supp supporting a local business and you're getting a really cool sign the, the doxing has commenced in the comments oh no he's a Bail bondsman. <laughs> that sounds like something people say, and then it just kind of takes off. Right, gets a mind of its own. Like, um, <laughs> what was that guy who used to work for ESPN who wore the big ties? He used to be a running back for uh, SMU. Craig, was it Craig something? Oh, oh, like bow ties? Yeah. Well, he wore like regular ties, but like oh. quadruple Windsor knots. Oh no. Yeah. I don't know him. There was like a story that he like killed some hookers or something, and it just kind of got a Oof. got a mind of its own. It, I don't know if it was a real story. I don't think it was a real story. That's a tough one because you can't prove it. Like j jail bondsman, bail, bail bonds. bondsman. Sorry, like Same from thing. a jail, from a jail. Um, bail bondsman. You you can Google that. Like you can check. Don't don't actually. <laughs> we we are not doxing him. Don't Google it. But you could, and it's verifiable. <laughs> The uh, whereas like Craig kill, James, Craig James, if he killed a hooker, there's no that story can take off because you can't prove or disprove it. Well, unless the cops actually investigated Caught it, him, um, yeah, no, but yeah, no, please don't do anything to Tony Padilla. We yeah. can't, uh, yeah, we can move Allie's on. Ali's legitimately concerned about this, it's actually just funny. <laughs> yeah, I know it is funny. Um, nothing is going to happen. See, no. 
That was we're not. <laughs> not. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're just one knot. No doxing. It's just one knot. <laughs> We're no. not doxing Tony Padilla. Yeah. Look, people are coming in now at a weird time. They sure are. You did come in at a weird Don't time. Don't dox funny. people. Um, no one dox anyone. But what you should do is uh, drink out of some aluminum cans from Ball. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Aren't those nice? They are nice. Yes. Uh, I was actually reading about the uh, uh, Minuteman missiles, which are a missile. We don't need to get in the whole... They're a missile. Um, and... They're actually, I heard they, they're filled with fuel. Wow. And they're basically like, there's no structure in the entire missile. It's just fuel inside. And so it has to be pressurized to keep it the right shape. But they crush like in an aluminum can if they're depressurized. Wow. Like a ball can. Wow. Thought I'd throw that out you there in case anybody is in that stuff. lob any of those at Tony Padilla. Never, <laughs> no <laughs> missiles at Tony Padilla. Unbelievably. No, none. We are condemning that. We are against that firmly. Official Absolutely. stance of yes. this podcast, DMVR. <laughs> I think nobody is more against Dr. Tony Padilla than Allie. Yeah. But everybody at the company against Everyone's it. against it, of course. We are so against it. That's not a joke either. We're actually, I know. It's starting to sound like a joke. <laughs> well, we always say everything. <laughs> it sounds like we're being sarcastic. We're being serious. We just need to stop being sarcastic so much. Ball, though. Ball. It's a great place to drink cans from. It's a great place to, to, uh, to work. Uh, they actually have a plant out in Golden. It's hiring. It has great reviews from uh, the human ooh, human rights campaign. I've said it so many times that I start to doubt the things that I say. Mm, but yeah, yes. human rights campaign, it's 100% score, all that kind of stuff. And it really is just like an awesome place. Zach's aunt works there. She vouches for it. Uh, if you're interested in working there, go to jobs.ball.com and search for Golden. That's jobs.ball.com. Dot com and search for golden. I'm going to get through this and then see why you're laughing. Um, <laughs> or you can text golden to 77222. Again, be unstoppable at ball. They support the buffs. They support all the teams here. Do it. Um, I demand thicker cans. I think RK is against too weak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, we're moving along, though. And what we're moving along to is our expectations. We figured it was time to reset these expectations hmm. because, uh, honestly, it was it was tough to pin down what to expect from this team this season. Um, it's so young, very few pieces that we've even seen play before. Uh, but now we've gotten an eight-game sample size. And so let's just start this off here. You feel better or worse about the buffs than you did before the season started? I feel slightly worse. I'm just going to be completely honest. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> again, I pointed out I feel better today than I felt I sorry. I feel better tonight than I felt this morning, um, because of the way they fought against UCLA. But they just don't have enough consistent outside scoring for me to really feel confident in them. Um, mm -hmm. Last year, you know, you had Jerry Horn, you had Deshaun Schwartz, you had McKinley Wright, who McKinley wasn't going to give you consistent scoring from the perimeter, but he could give you scoring from the perimeter, yep. and he could give you scoring from the mid range on just about any night. And of course, <laughs> he was just going to do his thing. You have Evan, who is a consistent scorer when he can stay on the floor. We've already talked about that enough. Yep. You have Jabari, who feels like he should be a consistent scorer, and I think the numbers would bear themselves out to say he has yes. been a consistent scorer this year. But you need more than that, and those guys get most of their work done on the inside, and it's just so hard to count on that in college basketball. So for me, I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, can you count on one of Keyshawn – KJ, Eli, maybe those three. Can you count on one of them to be going at least every night? And I just don't. I don't think you can. I agree. I agree. Um, I think that early in the season, obviously Keyshawn was your your leader in terms of scoring. He was the guy who gets the first try. He's the the one everybody focuses on and opens it up for everybody else. And I think because he kind of took that mantle when he faded off. And it became time for somebody else to step up and, and get hot for a few games. It, it just didn't happen smoothly. You know, now you get to the point where Jabari is kind of putting up some big numbers pretty consistently. But I just don't think that this team has gelled yet. It hasn't gotten to the point where it's figure out who does the scoring and then work off of them that night. And, and just that process 
of figuring out what your matchup is on any given night. And and I don't even know that matchup is the right word because matchup is like Jabari versus their power forward or whatever. It's it's a little bit of that combined with who's hot. And then figure out how does how do you beat a team when Jabari is hot? How do you beat a team when Evan is hot? When when Eli has that mid-range game working, how do you beat a team using that? And it's just figuring out all these different paths and on all these different ways that the offense can work. And it's just taking time, and it feels really clunky right now. It does. It does. <clears throat> and again, that's kind of why I just have to lower my expectations a little bit. And if, if you're going to put me on the spot and say, okay, well, what is the expectation? Mm -hmm. I've gone back to – I think going into the season, I said, hey, the expectation for this program should be top four in the Pac-12. Yeah. I'm coming back to top half. I think that that's probably smart. I think that, you know, you look at the game against Stanford, say they were picked number nine preseason. Preseason rankings don't mean anything. Nope. But you got to beat number nine and eight and seven if you're going to be top half. Yep. And I think that that is the fight that you're looking at right now. I also think that if you do steal a couple games, this team is going to be much better in a couple months than it is right now. And that's the key piece that I think people have to remember is that every player on this team is just going to be one notch above what they are. And if you can get through this stretch, winning some of these games against the mid-level teams in the Pac-12 in the next month or two, then the month or two after that, you should be able to steal a couple games from you know the third and fourth best teams. And who knows? Maybe you do get... I guess that's the only game against UCLA. So They don't get them at home? Let me think about that real quick. No, they do get them at home. Okay, it's good. so hard to think through... They, they don't get Cal at home, and they don't get USC on the road. That's how those preseason games work. It's, it's weird. It doesn't matter. Because it's a 20-game schedule, <clears throat> so you don't play two of the teams right, twice. Right, right. And so that's why they do the early season, because you don't make the full road trip or the full homestand. But point is, yeah, they, what, what, there's not there. What is up with this new thing of playing conference games before non-conference play is over? Um, I, I think it's just to, to buy attention. It's to play important games when nobody else is. I, I don't know if this is true, but I was told that the... Uh, I think what I was told was Bill Walton said that Stanford-Colorado game was the first conference game in the entire country. And so you have that that stands out. And then again, like the other way to play a 20-game conference schedule is to have a one-game road trip, a one weekend road trip to UCLA in the middle of February instead. And then you have one game in one week. I just hate it because I think we're going to lose to Tennessee and I think we're going to lose to Kansas. But I don't care about those games as because they serve as preparation for bigger games later in the season that mm -hmm. count for more. Yep. And I just don't like the fact that we played the best team in the Pac-12 before we got to play those guys and cut our teeth a little bit. It sucks. Um, and Tad was upset about it too. Good. You know, he said that a couple days ago. He said, I don't like it. I don't think it makes sense. But at the same time, with the 20-game schedule, it's just you just kind of have to live with how it works. He also said that this week in the season, the Stanford-UCLA-Tennessee stretch was one that he circled immediately and said, this is the test. This is like the litmus test to see where we are at. And maybe just the growth that you get from UCLA, Tennessee, Kansas pays off in March you hope. or late February when you really need it. Um, but it is, it's frustrating to me that to me, those games are put on the schedule with the idea of these are, these games are going to be where we grow. And your toughest matchup in the conference of the season was going to be at UCLA. Easily. You didn't get a chance to grow before you played the, before you played that game. You probably wouldn't win it either way. But I just think it's silly. Yep, it is silly. And it sucks. And just to, you know, go back to where we started, you know, my expectations are lower now too. I think that you see number 13 recruiting class or whatever in the country and think there's a chance that this is just full-on right, magic. Right. And it, it isn't. It's just not. It, and, it, that's, and that's not a it's problem. Not, no, it isn't. And it's not a big surprise either. This is probably a pretty average outcome for this recruiting class at this point. But it's true that you just need to see the growth. And it is going to be an uphill battle in 
most of the games in the first half of the season, and you just hope that that's not true in the second half because they've grown so much. Um, I liked what you said, that kind of like the standard coming in was top four in the conference, and I think that that's kind of where Tad has built this program to be, is that every year the goal is top four in the, in the conference, and you're disappointed when you don't get it, and I know that that hasn't happened all that often. Um, so it it's... It's something that Tad has done to himself by winning so many games. And now you're at the point where this isn't a t top tier Tad team. So, and again, step backward. Coming into the season, you know, we sat here on the preview show, which, by the way, if you want to see a, a Saturday neon sign in action, yeah. the first 10 minutes of the preview show were, uh, were great for that. <clears throat> we sat here and I said, look, it's not fair to expect this team to go to the tournament mm -hmm. because they're so young. Um, but there's hope that that could be the, the ceiling for this team. Yep. It doesn't look like they're there. And so, mm -hmm. again, I, I would never say that I made that the expectation, but I am now lower. Uh, you know, I'm officially putting my expectation on the fact of make the NIT. Yep. And go win a couple games in the NIT and make it, you know. Make a run. Make a run. Have some fun with it. Get a couple extra home games out of it. Um, hopefully, you know, make your way to Madison Square Garden, which is always a really cool thing. That's the final four, I believe. Okay. But, you know, again, because the football program has struggled for so long, people just throw all of their, like, leftover uh, disappointment onto the basketball <laughs> program. And yeah. they're like, oh, well, if the basketball program makes the tournament, it'll save all of this. And it's just not fair to put that on this team. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd i say, you know, make a postseason tournament. No, most, hopefully it's the NCAA tournament. It doesn't feel like that's where this team is headed. True. Um, but the NIT is a great tournament for a young team. There's countless success stories of young teams who made the NIT, learned about March basketball, and then came back the next year and the years following and really blew up. Most notably, Oregon recently who I believe won an NIT right before making uh, an Elite Eight or a Final Four. So keep an it's eye on it. It's the way it them. goes. It's the way it goes. Um, and I agree. Like, that is probably, at this point, the right expectation to say this is a team that should make the NIT, should win a couple games in the NIT. If you're not hoping for the NCAA tournament, though, I think you're crazy. I think you should you've hope see, for it. You've seen enough to be cheering for it. It's kind of like the Broncos with the playoffs, where it's like, it, it could happen, it could not happen, but it's it, still very much on the table and it's enough to get excited about. It's not they, like we're to the point where we should say, ah, eh, no. If they surprise me and beat one of Kansas or Tennessee, then I'll get back towards yeah. thinking that's more of a possibility. Makes sense to me. Um, let's close things out with this stock report. Uh, Allie has had this graphic prepared for us. <laughs> Great work from our producer. Uh, she killing it with the graphic. Um, so, stock report. Let's uh, let's start with our DraftKings king of the game. We've got Jabari Walker, who uh, played really well tonight. We talked about a little bit earlier. By far the best player for the Buffaloes on the floor tonight. I don't. Uh, he did a great job. He was. He he absolutely looked like he belonged on the court top to bottom i don't like seeing seven of 11 i don't want to see that i mean shoot more if you're shooting damn near 70 percent from the field shoot more 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 i don't want to see 7 11 i want to see 14 of 22 i agree and and i think that that's specifically true for jabari walker yes you know if it's if it's luke over or here's a good example neat clifford we got didn't some he end up with 25 because he hit a late three. I think that got him to 22. Let me check. Uh, Yeah, that that got him to 22. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but but there's some Neek Clifford hype in the chat, which I am all the way here for. Um, But Neek Clifford, in his role, 7 of 11 is what you're hoping for. You know, if, if Neek Clifford comes in, he, he, he takes his 11 shots, he hits 7 of them, that's what you want. Jabari Walker, he is the focal point of this team, or at least, I mean, if this team is what we hope that it's going to be, 
7 of 11 means shoot more. You don't see Jokic finish 7 of 11 anymore. You used to, mm -hmm. and everybody would complain and say, why don't you shoot more? And that just kind of, again, we're talking about what these people need to grow and develop Especially into. Especially in a game where no one else was shooting at that clip. Who's the next best in terms of the combination of, um, you know, volume and production? Parquet was 4 of 8. Neat Clifford was 3 of 6. So no one else really had it. No. Um, I'd like to see both. I'd like to see all three of those guys shoot more. For sure. In this game. For sure. Um, but most notably, Jabari, you are the best player on the team. You're the most talented player on the team. You're the most athletic player on the team. You're the tallest. You know, you're the, the yep. best combination of size, strength, and athleticism. Give me 20 shots on a night like tonight. And to be honest, if he went 7 of 20, I'd be feeling I would be happier than 7 of 11. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, stock has got to be up, though. It's four straight games for uh, uh, for four straight games for Jabari to have a double double, um, putting up some big scoring numbers in those games as well. I thought in the last game in particular it was a great defensive performance. Do you buy the stock or do you say, hey, it's it's pretty high right now. Maybe it's time to cash out just a little bit. Who's stock? Jabari. Oh, uh, heap it on. Okay. Just keep buying it. I like it. Again, a couple different guys tonight, and, and, and it's a mixed feeling for me. I saw another level from them that I just I want to see that every game. I want to see that Jabari Walker against Southern Illinois. Yeah. I mean, it's – I think – there was a lot, maybe even too much unselfishness through the first part of the season where you say any one of these players can go beat whoever they're guarding. So let everybody get theirs. When you get into a game like the UCLA game and you have Jabari, who's clearly your best matchup, mm -hmm. he is somebody who is going to win more often than not against whoever is guarding him. You have to go to that guy. This isn't like playing against Duquesne or whoever else they faced. So I, I think you're right. I'm not. It, I'm not buying heavy just because I'm in pretty deep and it's expensive right now. But it's still going up. I just want to point something out. You, you mentioned that early season too much unselfishness thing. I, I go back to a season a couple years ago where Derek White uh, is his one season as a Buffalo mm -hmm. and. From before the first tip of the first game, I knew that Derek White was the best player on that team. Mm -hmm. And I think in his heart, Derek White knew that Derek White was the best player on that team. But he was surrounded by Xavier Johnson and Wesley Gordon. And those guys have been playing at Colorado for four mm -hmm. years. And I felt like he thought, I need to give those guys an opportunity to be the guy before I just come in here and act like I'm the guy. Yeah. And that it makes sense. Ended up costing really. It ended up costing them that season. That it took the team, not just Derek, but the team, half the year to realize Derek is our guy. Just go to Derek, let him do everything. I don't know if Jabari's quite on the Derek White level, but the faster that this team realizes Jabari is our guy, mm -hmm. let's run everything through him. The better they'll be. I mean, there's similarities to Tyler Bay, right? Like like yes. having that athleticism playing that same position. The thing with Tyler is that, I mean, first of all, like Jabari, still pretty raw, still figuring out how to put these tools to use, but also he had McKinley Wright right there. Yes. And so McKinley Wright's going to drive everything. And for this CU team, I'm not sure if they know what exactly are these other pieces and just where are they in their development. You know, Keyshawn, two points tonight. It's not, it's not what you want to see. No. And that points more toward, okay, Jabari, this might be your job to be the, the first option scoring the ball, and then we work from there. Yes. Because we saw him get the ball in his hands and, and initiate possessions. He was bringing the ball up the court occasionally and just going in and driving and then making passes from there. It, maybe that is the path. Yep. And, and honestly, this Tad Boyle offense has never been known for being innovative or creative or special. And when it's at its best is when it just has a guy who you can give the ball at the top of the key and he just goes and gets fouled. Spencer <laughs> Dinwiddie, McKinley Wright. Oh. When you need it the most, you need a guy who can just say, like, I'm going to the rack. You're either fouling me or giving me a layup. Yeah. 
I, I like it. Um, let's let's touch on Keyshawn. Uh, we've talked about a lot of it. One of five, two points, four assists, no turnovers. Uh, you know, I, I wonder what Tad's saying tonight because it might be something like, you know, he the shot wasn't falling, but he still provided some other things for us. He didn't make mistakes. Obviously, this is not what we had envisioned for him in this game if, if we were looking ahead a few weeks ago. Are you buying stock? Are you, are you cashing out a little bit? Because it might still be decently high just considering what the ceiling is and the way we know he can shoot. Who is it? Keyshawn. Keyshawn? Okay. Um, I mean, the stock is way down. It's so down. Um, and I probably bought a lot the last time we talked about this. I know. So I have to hold on to it. Um... But I'm worried. I, I'm worried about Keyshawn. Uh, this was a game to go show, like, I'm, I've am i arrived as one of the better guards in the Pac-12 against probably the best point guard in the Pac-12 in Tiger Campbell. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, he didn't. He didn't show up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm a little concerned, not on a wide scale to the sense where I'm saying I got to sell my stock and mm -hmm. get the hell out of here. Concerned in a short-term period of, okay, maybe Keyshawn isn't the guy that I... Remember, early on in the season, Henry, I said this team is going to go as Keyshawn goes. I'm now worried that almost saying, like, ah, they better hope not. Because I don't know if he has it like that quite yet. Yeah. And I think that this being a matchup with Tiger Campbell hurt him a little bit. I think that, obviously, on the defensive end, he's spending a lot of time guarding yeah. Tiger... And when you have Tiger going at you like that and there's this pressure on you to kind of give it back to him, that's not an easy situation for a young guard to be in. But, like, those are the situations that McKinley was always at his best. It, for sure. And so, again, it's not fair to compare him to McKinley. Nope. But there were moments in, that, in the early stretch of the season where I thought, wow, he might just be the next coming of McKinley. Mm -hmm. He's not. No, nope. um, and that's okay. That it, it shouldn't be expected, mm -hmm. but I mean, McKinley would have been out there going bucket for bucket with Tiger Campbell the same way he did it with Remy Martin over yep. and over and over again, and it's it's a little tough when you don't have that guy anymore. Yeah, and I'm gonna hold the Keyshawn stock for now. Yeah, I'm not I'm not gonna buy much more just because you've got Tennessee coming up. You've, you've got Remy Martin on the schedule, and you probably expect at this point something similar. I think after that, I'm going to buy. I think that by the end of the season, he figures some things out. Who do they play next? Uh, next Tennessee. is Tennessee. And I think Eastern Washington after that. So that's one that's maybe yeah potential bounce back game. And then Kansas after that? Uh, I, they've got a couple more before Kansas. Okay, good. Thank God. Um, yes. Yeah, a couple of these guys need to get their mojo back a little bit. They do. I don't know if Tennessee's the team to get it back against. But that one's at home. That'll go a long way. Let's hit Evan next. The foul trouble. We've seen the highs. We've seen the lows this season. Yeah, his stock is down, um, and that's unfortunate. Just because it's not about his ability. Mm -hmm. It's about his ability to stay on the floor. Yep. Um, and it just feels like there's some scouting report out there on him right now that the coaching staff hasn't figured out how to stop yet. Um, and so, I mean, it's tough because a lot can happen in the first six to eight minutes of a basketball game that will decide it in the end. But it's almost like you want to tell him, like, you keep your hands directly in the air for the first eight minutes of the game. You, his size alone, his strength alone, his, his sheer girth alone <laughs> is going to make shots difficult for guys. He cannot give the refs any excuse to call a foul on him early in the game because as soon as he gets one, he gets two, and then you don't see him until the second half, and it just can't happen. It cannot continue to happen, or else his final season in Boulder is going to be marred by foul trouble. Yeah, and the other thing is that he's playing pretty well. 8 of 11 from 3, coming off a career high in the last game. If somebody wanted to sell the stock right now, you, you can't really blame them. I think there's signs that say it could be a bit of a rough season. There's plenty of reason to think there's going to be regression. Not because he can't be a good basketball player, but because 8 of 11 from 3 probably just isn't sustainable. Um, again, you, still, it's Evan, and that's why you have to throw 
probably into everything that you say when you say anything negative just because we've seen all the things that he can do and there's no reason to think that he isn't capable of more um i just have a policy i'm not going to bet against evan and so i'm not going to no. sell stock so be right here holding on to it yeah i'll probably even buy some because Why i not? think he'll figure it out um by the way, Mike in the comments here saying, what was McKinley as a freshman or sophomore? Not fair to compare to his junior or senior years. First of all, he still was that guy as a freshman and sophomore. Second of all, it isn't fair. It isn't. Keyshawn should not be compared <laughs> to, to McKinley ever. No. It's not fair. So I'm, I, I'm not trying to do that. Um, but I will. I, I was just admitting that I let my mind go there when he started off so hot at the season of, wow, they might just have a replacement just waiting in the wings uh and that wasn't fair either yep. and it's not fair to compare him ever but mckinley really was that guy from start to finish of his career he got obviously yep. got better as he went on but he was always that bulldog you're not going to give it to me without taking a little bit on the other end too yeah yeah it's interesting um who else is there anybody else who stands out to you want to buy um, um tristan da silva parquet o'brien hammond simpson I, I, clifford lovering I, we haven't mentioned neek yet and that's another guy who looked like he belonged he out did. there um now he's like half a tick away um he's still a little looks like he's still getting used to his body and and maybe just needs a little bit more strength not that he isn't strong already but that that's kind of what puts him over the top. That's what makes him a stalwart defensively. That's what helps him turn three of six into four or five of six because he's finishing. Yeah, the word I would use is seasoning. It's a little more seasoning. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a little strength. It's a little skill. It's a little comfort out there on the floor. You see his athleticism flash in massive ways, never more than when he's rebounding the basketball. And that, to me, is like one of the biggest signs of athleticism. When you're just seeing these guys sky into the air to go get basketballs and, and get rebounds, yep. that's when you say, like, wow, that guy's a freak athlete. Um, and he is a freak athlete. He's just not quite used to being a freak athlete yet. And, and I, when I say not quite, I mean, like, it is that close. He's still a good player. Oh, yes. He's just not – he's capable of more. You're going to see it. It could happen tomorrow. It might not happen until next season. That just applies to so many of these guys. Yes. And, it, and it's exciting. It is. To me, it's exciting because I'm not looking for instant gratification when I watch this team. Um, I see so much potential in them that, you know, I don't know where this patience came from in my life, <laughs> um, but I have it with, with these teams now. Like, I see it a little bit with the Broncos, too, and I'm like, wow, like, Jerry Judy's almost there, and Javante Williams is almost there, and Pat Sertan is might already be there. Um, and it's just like, okay, well, I, I like have this patience now to wait for this. With this team, it really is going to require a little bit of patience. And I just look across the board, and there's so many guys like Neek, which is like, oh, this guy is so close to being so yep. good. And, uh, and, and I'm excited to see that. I'm really excited to see that from him. But I, I will just shovel money into his stock right now because i think that he is so close to being like all pac 12 caliber type player i agree i think that that's a good one um i'll throw kj in there i'll buy more kj stock you saw the explosiveness you saw the ability to get to the rim just needs a little bit more finishing just three of nine tonight O of three from three either knock down a couple of threes, either finish a couple of those layups, get to the line on some of those layups. He just needs one of those things to click for him. And then I feel like that opens the other ones up. And what I guess only one rebound tonight. That's kind of disappointing. You, you almost expect him to be at like four or five rebounds just because he gets up so high. I'm, I'm still all in on KJ. I'll, get, I'll take more of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean... <clears throat> he uh, he's another one it's just like uh and s as soon as he knows where to channel that energy yep he has so much energy sometimes he just channels it into the wrong not in the wrong places but he channels too much energy at once uh, and gets himself into some bad positions on the floor or dribbles into a turnover or whatever it is um i'm so high on this roster and i'm so high on all these kids it's just 
It's just going to take a little time. Let that thing marinate. Yep. Let it brew. Uh, and it really could be by the end of this season, we're talking about, uh, you know, f- just to put a number on it, let's say KJ Simpson stock is at, you know, uh, $30 right now. Mm-hmm. That could be a $100 stock by the end of the season. Easily. Easily. It's and- just, it might not. It might be next season. It, c- it could be his junior year when he finally explodes mm-hmm. and becomes the guy that we know he can be. It's tough to know this stuff because we we so badly in sports want development to be linear. It doesn't work like that. He nope. doesn't just step on the floor and keep going up until he reaches his potential. It's, there's ups, there's downs, there's flat spots. And you can't predict when those big jumps are going to come. Throw Julian Hammond in there too. He gets those. I don't know what it means that he got those late minutes in that game, but it means something. And the fact that he's on the floor makes it a decent bet to bet on him. Who especially wasn't on the floor because of it? That's actually a great question. Let me see who subbed off for him. Was it um, Keyshawn? That, that's where your mind goes, right? Yeah. Um, I wonder if, not, not as a knock on Julian, I just wonder if there's something that Keyshawn did. I'm thinking it was Keyshawn. It could have been KJ. Um, if there's something that someone did, that's a safer way of it putting it. It was things. KJ. Okay. And... There's, so actually, KJ went in for Keyshawn with six minutes left. Hammond went in for KJ with four minutes left. Who were the five on the floor? So, would have been Neek, Tristan, Jabari. Well, Lawson went out. Yeah, Jabari and Neek, Eli. Tristan, Jabari. Okay. So no, no Keyshawn either. No Keyshawn. No KJ. So that. It, I don't know what it means. I'm just. I think it was Tad was really disappointed in both guys, and just said like, "Screw it, Julian, go in there because these other guys aren't getting the job." Done. I remember all preseason, Tad was calling it a three-headed monster at point guard. It's weird for a guy to not play the whole game and then play the last four minutes. It, I'm sure. I mean, obviously, I did this instead of jumping on the call afterward. Somebody had to have asked Tad, and if nobody asked Tad about that tonight, ask I'll, I'll ask him at practice. Yeah, a little weird. A little weird. weird. I, my guess is it had more to do with the other two guys than it did to, to Julian. Not to say that... That's still an opportunity. Absolutely. That's still an opportunity. Uh, I think that's all we got for you guys tonight. Uh, I'll be back on Saturday after the Tennessee game. We'll be right here at the bar again uh, doing post-game show after they play the number 13 Tennessee Volunteers. On your way out of the YouTube chat, make sure you give us a thumbs up, give us a subscription, and uh, we appreciate you guys for watching. We'll see you then.